Hi, welcome to the guitar department. I'm Joe Walton, I'm your host. Today, we're gonna to talk about I Love Rock and Roll by Joan Jett. We're gonna learn a little bit more about the cage system that we touched on last week. We've got a special guest lick of the week from Awakening Forces' Tyler Halverson. And we're gonna talk about the Boss Katana in the Tone Zone. Welcome to the guitar department. <laughs> The song I Love Rock and Roll by Joan Jett, actually a cover from Alan Merrill and the Arrows from the 70s. Joan Jett's version has two separate guitar parts, and we're going to go over both of them. They're both pretty simple. The first one, Joan Jett's part, is actually just three power chords and one lick, and we're going to learn how she plays this. Now, I watched a couple of online videos just to make sure I had this correct, and they both had them wrong. So I looked up Joan Jett herself playing it live in 1982. Here's what she does. She starts out on an E power chord on the seventh fret. So we're gonna put our pointer finger on the seventh fret of the fifth string, and then I'm just flattening my pinky across the next two strings on the ninth fret. You could use your third finger and pinky if you needed to to get the same effect. But the point is, we're only gonna play those three strings. Just like that. And that's our first chord. One, two, three, four. Just like that. So, we're actually gonna hit it on beats one and three. One, two, three, four, and then we're gonna jump to the A. Now the A is on the fifth, or the sixth string, excuse me, the fifth fret of the sixth string. So we're gonna take the same power chord shape and move it up a string to the sixth string. I've got my pointer finger on five, my pinky finger now is on the seventh fret of the fourth and fifth strings. Just one time there, and by one time, I mean we're hitting it twice each. So one set of two. Then we're gonna move that from five to seven. So it'll be on five and seven to seven and nine. Just like that. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then we're gonna sort of repeat most of that. We're gonna move back down a string to the fifth string. And then we have a bit of a weird transition. The time signature actually changes at this point of the song. So we have one measure that's just two beats. And so obviously I moved from five and seven on the top string to seven and nine. Musically speaking, that's an A power chord to a B power chord. But then in transition, we just sort of open up and hit the top two strings, which you'll notice just doesn't sound very good and it works because we don't stay there. We're gonna hit that and immediately jump down to the next string, seven and nine back to our E power chord, our first chord. So that whole sequence goes Then we're gonna wait for three more beats, so two, three, Four, hit it one more time, and then comes our little lick. Now, this lick is played two different ways. One way is by the lead player, and one way is by uh, Joan Jett herself. And the way Joan Jett plays it is an octave, actually two octaves lower. So we're gonna jump to the fifth fret, give that fifth string a bit of a yank, so that we get at least, a, at least a half step, if not a whole step bend, a five to seven bend. You wanna make your five, your D, sound like an E, which is the seventh fret. Then we're gonna jump, after returning that back to its original position, we're gonna jump to the seventh fret, the B on the top string, down to the A on the fifth fret, and then the whole hand jumps down to the third fret. So we land on that G, and that G is gonna be important when we get to the lead part too, but that's the whole lick. Uh, bend on five, return it to its original position, jump up to the seventh fret, jump down to the five with your pointer finger, and then all the way down to three. So that whole intro part, and this is also the chorus too, um, they're both played the same way. Four. 
just like that. While that's happening, the lead player is playing it the same harmony a slightly different way. We've got the same E, A, and B chords, except they're not actually the same at all. Um, we're going to start down here on a low E. And that's going to be our opening chord. And then we're going to play that the second time, but after we play it the second time, we're going to release the chord with the pointer finger and grab that third fret, that G again, uh, with our second finger and give it a little bit of a bend. Now this is a lot more of a slight bend than the one that we did on the five earlier. Just like that. And there's another difference there too. The three, the five, or excuse me, the three, the G, when you bend it, it doesn't actually return to its original position. It's not like that. It just goes upward and then you release it into that next chord. And notice when I released it that my finger stayed on the string for just a second longer while I got the other chord in position. That's to make sure that we don't actually get a pull off like that. We want it to go up, sort of like it's revving into that A chord. And I'm using the, th the middle finger just to mute that string while my pointer finger has moved down a string from the uh, second fret of the fifth string to the second fret of the fourth string. And with my right hand, I'm playing the fifth, fourth, and third strings for that A chord. Then comes our B chord, which now will be the second fret of the fifth string and the fourth fret of the third and fourth strings. And that will bring us back to that G that we bent earlier. This time, instead of going to the A chord afterwards, we're going back to the E chord, the original chord. So this is actually kind of a tricky thing to get used to, but once you get it, it'll be really, really useful. There's a lot of songs that use this, uh, Led Zeppelin, ACDC. It's just sort of a, a really, not to use the same term twice, but it's a classic, classic rock lick. There's just a lot you can do with that. Um, so in this case, though, uh, the riff sounds like this. And then, for our uh, time signature change, that same part where we had to jump the open strings, we're going to hit this uh, B chord, the 2-4-4 four, four combination on the 5th, 3rd, and 4th strings. Hit the same open strings that we did before, but this time we're going to jump up to 7 and 9, just like Joan Jett was playing the, the E chord earlier. So it'll go like that, one more time on that chord, and then we have our riff. And now the lead part, instead of being down here, we're going to play the same notes two octaves higher. And that puts us on the 15th fret of the B string. Uh, musically speaking, this is a D that we're going to start out on. And we're going to bend that D to sound like an E. So that's a whole step bend from 15, uh, yeah, 15 to 17. We're going to return that to its original position jump down to the 12th fret on the uh, B string, so that's the same string, and then just go up a string and go 14 to 12 on the third string, just like that. Now, bending is probably the hardest part of this lick. If you can get that bend to sound correct, the rest of the lick isn't actually that hard to play. You just jump down to 12, 14, and 12 again. Um, the trick here for the bend is to remember that the pressure is all on the third finger. But you'll notice that I have two other fingers on the same string uh, helping out with muscle. What I want to do is keep my pointer finger on 12 because that's my next note. I want to stay in position. If I move my pointer finger up, it's going to put me in what's called 13th position. Basically the positions are named after whatever fret your pointer finger is on. So, I want to stay in 12th position and have my third finger on 15 and then my middle finger just sort of lands wherever it's natural. In this case it's on the 14th fret. But these two fingers, the pointer and middle finger, are just there for muscle purposes. They don't control the note ringing out. Which means that if your note dies either on the way up or the way down, it's your ring finger's fault. Your ring finger lost pressure on the string for uh, could be any number of reasons. 
Uh, what you want to do is try to keep the finger pressure on the string and push upward using the whole hand. You might notice when I'm doing that, I'm not pushing my fingers out and flattening them because that can lead to the note dying when it comes back down. Um, one of the bigger problems is that the pad of the finger rolls up underneath the string and just lifts it up a little bit, just enough to get that note to, uh, to die. And so what we want is to keep that note ringing out all the way up and down. And then back to the 12, up a string, 14, 12. And that's our main lick. So that whole part, the lead part, So that brings us to the first verse. And the Joan Jett's part for the first verse is actually really simple. She carries the same chords that she was playing during the chorus and the intro, but she plays them uh, exactly the same way with that riff uh, happening twice along the way. So it happens like this. You start on your E power chord up on the seventh and ninth fret. Two, three, four, then again. Then the riff. Again. Two, three, then up a string to B, same riff. Then comes the little, uh, the, oh, we'll call it the pre-chorus, a little progression that happens right before we jump back into the chorus. So that was our A power chord on five and seven of the top string. Up to seven and nine for the B chord down a string for the E chord, and then back to our A chord again. And we're just going to let that chord ring until it either dies naturally or we have, might have to fade it out using the volume knob on the guitar. If you have to do that, then mute the strings and pot it right back up because after, uh, I believe it's eight beats, we're going to jump back to the B chord, the seven and nine on the top string. And that's just eight solid hits right in a row. One and two and three and four and. And right back into the chorus. Now the chorus is the same as the intro, so that actually completes most of the song for us. Um, we play that intro, our first verse. That intro doubles as our chorus, so we play that and then the second verse. Um, back to that intro again, which would be the second chorus this time. And then the verse plays again with the guitar solo happening over top of it. We're going to touch on a little bit of what happens in the guitar solo in the next segment. And then uh, we have what we would call the outro. It's sort of a, a version, a, a portion of the chorus played four times in a row up to the time change. And we'll go over exactly how that happens here in a minute. But the lead part for the, uh, the verse part is essentially the same thing. We play those same chords that we played in the uh, chorus intro part. Two, three, four. Jump up for the riff. Two, three, four to the B chord, two and four. Up to the riff. And then you can play these chords either way. They're going to sound uh, the same whether you play them the way the lead guy plays them or the way Joan Jett plays them, but it'll be A, B, up to the octave, the higher octave of E, and then back down to the A. And then just fade that out. Or, uh, like what happens in the live version, he hits that A chord. hits the whammy bar a few times just to sort of uh, give it a little more life. But it still fades at about the same rate, and then you come back in on that B chord right before you switch over to the chorus again. And now it's time for part two of our caged system series. And what I'd like to show you is how to turn one of the chords we talked about into a scale. 
Um, I mentioned in the first segment of the CAGE series uh, last time that what the whole point of it is to sort of open up the neck so that you can play sort of seamlessly from one position into the next, into the next, without having to uh, return to the original pattern that you know uh, a little better than the others. I'm going to start with the G chord. But here's how it works when you're trying to turn it into a scale. We have our G shape. And that will lend us to the G major pentatonic, which would start on the third fret, the root of the G chord. And then our next note in the chord is a two, a B, uh, on the A string. So we're going to start on the A and just play zero and two, the A and the B. Then we'll move down another string. And in the chord, it's just a zero. But we're going to add the second fret also, which will be a, a D to an E. And then the octave starts over at G. We have another A on the second fret. And then our last two strings are going to be zero and three, which will be a B, a D, an E, and a G. So we're essentially playing the five notes, G, A, B, E, D, twice over, with the G happening a third time at the very end. And just playing it with that rhythm sort of gives it a bit of a, a major pentatonic lick sound. So, now we've turned our G major pentatonic, or our G major chord, excuse me, into a G major pentatonic scale. And once you have a pentatonic scale, you can do exactly the same thing we did with the G chord in the previous segment. You can take it, move it up a fret, and use your pointer finger to carry the zeros up with you. So the zeros turn into ones, and you finger it a little differently, but this time it's a scale. It's not a chord, so we don't have to worry about doing some silly stretch with all of our fingers. Uh, the way I'm going to finger this is one finger per fret. Pinky will take the first note. In this case, it's going to be a G sharp. And then the rest of the notes will follow suit. Instead of 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 2, we're going to play 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, 3. And then our bottom two strings will be 1 and 4. And that gives us a major pentatonic scale. Um, that's useful in a lot of different ways. You use it a lot in country, folk, southern rock music, anything that you want to sound uh, a bit less bluesy and a bit more folky is the way I think of it anyway. Um, but it doesn't stop there. We can take our pinky note and add in the top string, the sixth string on the first fret. And then our major pentatonic could become a minor pentatonic. Or you could just think of it as a note that's added to the lower end of the major pentatonic. But if you think of this as the root, then we have our basic box form of the minor pentatonic. They're treated a bit differently, but they're actually played the same way. Uh, the difference is mostly in how you resolve uh, each of your licks. If you're playing a major pentatonic, you'll end on the root of the major pentatonic scale, which in this case, since we're on the first fret, will be a G sharp, or an A flat if you prefer. If you think of it as a minor pentatonic, then we're going to end on F. And now it suddenly has a little bit more of a bluesy tone to it. Um, so that's the basics of how this works. Now, if you move this up, of course, all the notes change. So if you want, in this case, a B flat uh, major pentatonic, then we just move it to the third fret. Whatever note your pinky is on will dictate the rest of the notes and the key that you're in. Your first note would act as the root of the minor pentatonic. So if you wanted to play a G minor pentatonic or a G minor blues scale, then you think of your root as the first finger. And what we're going to do with that now is we're going to add in the missing tones. And by the missing tones, I mean we're going to make it into a diatonic major or minor scale. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to jump back to the G. So if I'm on G, 
what I want is to add G, A, B, C. That'll be one of the missing tones, is the fourth note of the major scale. And then we've got our fifth note and sixth note, which are E and D. And then I'm going to add in the F sharp. And then in the second octave, I'll do the same. Now I have to play the F sharp here because I can't lower my position to play the F sharp on the G string. But once you have a movable pattern, for instance here as a B flat major scale, I can just shift back one fret and use my pointer finger there on the second fret, the A, and uh, that'll be our leading tone into the B flat root. So that gives us a major scale, and if we start with our pointer finger on the third fret, that'll give us a G minor scale. What we have to do is add in that A on the fifth fret of the, the top string, the sixth string, and then we have our minor scale with the same pattern. Now the major scale comes in really handy in this position because it's easy to play a major pentatonic. But to add in just a few color tones adds quite a bit to the texture of your scale. So there's a lot more improv uh, colorization that you can throw in with those tones. And that's how you take your G major shape from the caged system and use it to make both your G major scale and the relative minor, the E minor, and move them into movable shapes and patterns to use all over the neck. Coming up next, we're going to have a special guest lick of the week from Awakening Forces, Tyler Halverson. Hey everybody, I'm Tyler, and on today's Lick of the Week, I'm going to be teaching you a lick from my band, Awakening Forces' new single, Too Late to Change. All right, so um, to preface this, I'm using what's called a seven-string guitar uh, that's tuned to drop A, but for those of you at home, you can use your normal guitar, six string guitar tuned to E standard. Um, I've just got an extra string on the top that's tuned to A, um, but for this lick, you won't need it. So we're gonna start, this song is in the key of A, and this lick specifically is using the natural minor scale. So here's the lick that we're gonna learn. I'm gonna play it fast first, then I'll play it slow and we'll break it down. And here it is slow. So we're gonna start on the 10th fret of the B string. And we're gonna use eighth notes here. So we're gonna do four segments, and each segment has four notes in it. Um, we're gonna start, like I said, on the 10th fret of the B string. We're gonna play one and, and then we're gonna go to the 13th fret of the E string, play two and, three and on the 12th fret of the E string, and then four and on the 13th fret of the B string. So all together we have like that. And all the segments to follow are going to be the exact same. We're just going to switch up the notes. So next, we're going to go to the ninth fret of the G string. We're going to do 9. Then we're going to go to 12, and then 10 on the B string. So 12 on the B string, 10 on the B string. And then you're going to hop up to 12 on the G string. that same eighth note pattern. Then we're going to move down to five on the G string, eight on the B string, six on the B string, and then five on the B string. So we're going to do that same eighth note pattern once again. And then we're going to move down for the last section, and we're going to go second fret on the G string, sixth fret on the B string, fifth fret on the B string, and then the third fret of the B string. And then we're just going to, from three, we're going to slide up to 10 on the B string, and then do a little bit of vibrato. Just like that. So I'm going to play the lick one more time, and then you guys can try it at home.
And once again, a big thank you to my guitar teacher, Joe Alton, um, who taught me guitar and is allowing me to come do this. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And yeah. <laughs>